the title of tonight's share is why you should not believe the theory of evolution. Notice I didn't title it why the theory of evolution is false. There's a very important difference between those two propositions. There are two different reasons why you shouldn't believe something. Let's say someone says, gee, look what I just read on CNN. And I say, well, I happen to look that up in Encyclopedia Britannica, and Encyclopedia Britannica says that CNN is wrong. Now, is this a hard question? Which would you choose? Encyclopedia Britannica or CNN? I don't know what you, but I'd choose the Britannica, right? Because Britannica is reason to think the CNN report is false. That's a good reason not to believe the CNN report. That's one sort of reason for not believing something. Because you have good reason to think it's false. Second case, someone says, look at this. Look what I found in Encyclopedia Britannica. PQR. And I say, really? That sounds pretty strange to me. Um, let me check the date of the Britannica that you're looking at. And it turns out that it's 1983. I think we would say, look, a lot of things changed in you know, that many years, um, 32 years. Now, I don't know that it's false, but I know that the Britannica of 1983 is not a good reason to believe it. You haven't got a good reason to believe it. That's another reason why you shouldn't believe something, because the reasons are given in favor of it aren't adequate to support it. Someone says don't believe something, you must get clear at the outset, why is he telling you not to believe it? Is it because he has reason to think it's false? Or is it because he thinks that the reasons that are offered in its favor are insufficient? I'm taking the latter line. I'm not claiming it's false. I'm not claiming I know that it's false. But I am claiming, and I intend to show you, that the reasons that are offered in its favor are not adequate to convince a reasonable person that he should believe it. Okay, is that clear? Now, the first reason is in a way, I think, the strongest and the simplest. So let me run through it, and we want to discuss it and analyze it. I'm happy to do that until it's as clear as possible in your minds. Um, I want to give you an analogy, which has nothing to do with evolution, so as to keep passions at bay, and then I'll show you how it applies. I have an object, and on this object, on one side of this object, I have painted an X. Now, I tell you, I threw this object into the air three times, and three times in a row, it landed on the X by accident. No one controlled it, guided it, it's not weighted, not magnetized, it hasn't got scratches that catch the airwaves that cause it to fall one way or another. It fell three times in a row, on the same side, the X side, by accident. Do you believe me? Disbelieve me? What would your attitude be towards a statement like that? Reasonable to make a statement like that? Well, if you are assuming that the probability is one-eighth because it was a coin, but I didn't say it was a coin, I said it was an object. Suppose an object with a thousand sides. Then the probability of falling on the same side three times in a row is one in an American billion. That's nine zeros. The poor British have 12 zeros in their billion. Um, I don't think you should believe that. If I say it fell on the same side in a, three times in a row by accident and the probability is one in a billion, I think you'd say chances are somebody was fooling around with it. Just too unlikely to, to take seriously. Now, suppose I refuse to tell you how many sides the object has. I refuse to tell you. And yet I say, it fell three times on the X side in a row by accident. What should your reaction be to a statement like that? I think your reaction should be, I haven't given you enough information to make up your mind. Because since I say it happened by accident, then... The only thing that's important to know, to make up your mind, whether you should believe it or not, is what's the probability of it's happening by accident? And if I don't tell you what the probability is, so then there's no way for you to make up your mind whether it happened or not. Now, the theory of evolution is in exactly that position. The theory of evolution says 
There's a certain process which is undirected, uncontrolled, unmanaged. It produces variations in an accidental fashion. Then there's selection, which is not accidental, but the variations are produced in an accidental fashion. And it is responsible from starting from the first self-replicator, whatever that is. If we have time, we'll talk about that as well. First thing to make copies of itself, all the way up to butterflies and sequoia trees and tuna and beetles and human beings, just by this accidental, undirected, unmanaged, unfocused process. Key question that we have to ask is, what is the probability that the whole of life arose from some ancestor that made copies of itself and diversified into the envelope of our life that we see in front of us. What is the probability of that's happening? At this point, the true believer rolls out the billions of years. But we'll just put that into the question. What probability is there of it's happening in all those billions of years? What's the probability? Show us the probability. Show us the evidence and the calculation that gives us the probability. Well, this demand has been made for 40 years anyway. There is no probability. There is no evidence. There is no estimate. Evolution has been challenged at, on this basis over and over again. And no one has even tried to rise to the challenge. The latest famous, infamous challenge was Thomas Nagel's Mind and Cosmos, where he said, what we need is evidence that the probability of evolution producing life that we know is anything but infinitesimally small, even in the billions of years. We want evidence of that. If we don't have evidence of that, there's not sufficient reason to pledge allegiance to it. And of all the vilifications and all the abuse that he took for making that obviously rational statement, not one said, look, here are the books that lay out the evidence, and here are the books that lay out the probability. The calculation is there. It's in the literature. Take a look at it. Not one said that. Obviously, it doesn't exist. Indeed, in a minute, I'll explain to you why it can't exist. But that's true no matter, else, no matter what else people say, no matter what else people offer, it can't be enough to make a reasonable person say yes. As I said at the outset, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but it certainly means there isn't adequate reason to say that it's right. Are we good so far? Now, the reason why they're not going to produce it is this. Whatever this first thing that made copies of itself was, some kind of complicated molecule is the best guess. Since that molecule to butterflies and sequoia trees and orangutans and uh, coral and all the rest, since that time, there have to be millions of mutations. Millions of mutations depending upon the circumstances that existed over billions of years of the Earth's history, where temperature changed and the chemical composition of the seas changed and the presence of um, cosmic rays changed and other types of free radiation. Strictly speaking, what you'd have to do is trace the development of the DNA, change by change, and calculate the probability of each change in the context in which it took place. With an estimate of the numbers of trillions of cells that are available, and cells that are available in various conditions, different places in the, in the biosphere, nobody's even going to begin to try to do that. It's far too complex, far too difficult. Now, at this point, some people say, well, then you're asking for something impossible. OK. So we're asking for something impossible. So what? Well, it's not reasonable to ask for things that are impossible, is it? The answer is, well, it depends upon what you're claiming. <laughs> you're claiming that this accidental process produced the whole envelope of life. You want me to believe it. If you want me to believe it, then you ought to produce a probability. You tell me it's impossible for you to produce a probability? What you're telling me is it's impossible for you to give me reason to believe it. 
Okay, I accept that. Then why should I believe it? If it's really impossible for you to give me reason to believe it, then why should I believe it? I'll give you an analogy. You believe in evolution, so you believe somewhere in Earth's history was the first cell. I ask you, was it the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere? You say, well, who knows? And you know, information tends to get washed out, even, do, even with respect to the chaos principles. Some of it does get washed out. Uh, it would be hopeless to find any, any information about that, right? Then I say, it's not appropriate to believe it was in the Northern Hemisphere, nor appropriate to believe it was in the Southern Hemisphere. Since you can't have evidence where it was, then just confess your ignorance as to where it was. Don't say, and therefore I say it was in the North. No, you can't say that. If you don't have the evidence where it was, then just admit you don't know. And I say the same thing about evolution. If you can't have enough evidence to give me the probability of it's happening the way you claim, then just admit that you're ignorant. Now, some people say, well, look, isn't it the way science works that you want to explain something, so you think up hypothesis, something that would do the explaining, and you propose it, and as long as it works, you stick with it unless and until somebody gives you a better hypothesis. Isn't that the way scientists, science works? Even if the first hypothesis isn't very strong, but until somebody produces a better one, it's appropriate to accept the one that's on the table. And the answer is no, that's not correct. In order to be accepted because it's on the table, there has to be some minimum credibility, some minimum amount of evidence that's in its favor. Otherwise, the appropriate thing to do, even in science, the word even there is a little prejudicial against science, but even in science, the appropriate thing to do is simply confess your ignorance. Here's an example. Um, a, a murder has been committed, and there are four people who could have committed it. So far in the investigation, all we have turned up is that one person has a motive. We don't know whether the other people have motives or not. We haven't found any fingerprints or footprints or murder weapons, or, but we know that he has a motive. Can you lock him up? It's the best hypothesis you have. Better than all the others. There aren't any others. It's the only one on the table. So lock him up. No, you can't lock him up. Because having a motive is not enough. It's not enough to take seriously. Similarly here, the fact that someone has proposed it, but can't give you the key element of evidence that's necessary to take it seriously, does not make it the best going hypothesis, which should be accepted until and unless something better comes along. It's missing the one key piece of evidence that it needs to be taken seriously, and so long as it's missing that, there's no reason to accept it. Again, that doesn't show it's wrong, but there's certainly no reason to accept it as true. Now, we get, now listen, I challenge you, as I have challenged two or more decades of students, write this to your biology professors, write this to your philosophy professors, the true believers, the evolutionists, and get me an answer. Get me an answer. Show me someone who'll tell you, yes, there's enough evidence to believe it, even though we don't have a probability. Explain why that is, seeing as how, in any other case, where you claim something happened through an accidental process, what you want is a probability. You wouldn't trust such a hypothesis anywhere if you didn't have a probability. Yeah? I have a question. Isn't the word accidental kind of prejudicial? Where, you know, if you have the evidence of, you know, sort of slightly changing... Um, forms and that sort of thing over a long period of time, you know, you got to do something with the evidence. You can't just disregard it. Okay, now this is very important. What you're asking is very important. Um, Ernst Meyer, who is one of the deans of evolutionary thinkers, was a professor at Harvard. I think he's still a professor of emeritus at Harvard. And in general, he's very good. He's very good. I've read a number of his books and his essays. And uh, he tries to be careful and he's imaginative. And he, okay, there. He comes to the critique, as everybody does here and there. He wrote an essay on the five different meanings of the word evolution. And that means when you are conducting a discussion about evolution, man, you've got to be careful. And you have to describe what it is you're talking about. I haven't said anything. I took it for granted. But let's go through that a little bit. So I'll tell you what, exactly what I'm talking about. Um, one of the meanings of the word evolution is pretty close to what you just said. And that is things have changed. Things have not always been exactly the same. Things have changed. The life. Uh, the living elements on the planet over time have changed and been different. Change is against to stasis, everything always remaining the same. 
by the way, there was a 19th century German biologist who said that evolution is as obvious as that the Earth goes around the sun. And that was quoted in the last 30 or 40 years, and people were puzzled by it. And how could you say something like that? Something that's so controversial and so difficult and so debated and discussed, how could it be obviously true? The answer is, when he said evolution, what he meant was change. Thousands of years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, life forms were different. I think everybody agrees to that. That really is obvious because you find the fossils and you find saber teeth tigers and woolly mammoths and things like that. Okay, so things have changed. That's one re meaning. That's not the meaning that I'm talking about here. Another meaning of evolution is that everything goes back to a common ancestor. I'm not talking about that, and it's not so easy to show that that's true. Elliot Sober has a technical paper where he shows that the evidence to demonstrate common ancestry has never been has never been amassed appropriately, okay, but I'm not talking about that, that uh, sense of, of evolution. Um, another sense of evolution is evolution as opposed to revolution or as opposed to um, what are called jumps, and that is it's a gradual process rather than a process of large-scale changes in the forms of life. Um, that's controversial. The fossil record doesn't show the kind of gradual changes that Darwin hoped for, and uh, uh, punctuated equilibria was created to try to pl plug that gap. I'm not talking about that either. There's a fourth meaning that has to do with speciation, how new species come into existence. I'm not talking about that either. The fifth meaning, which is the central meaning that people discuss and debate, is that the engine of change, what produces the change, is random variations plus selection. Things change without any direction, any goal, any control, any design, any management. They change for, in that sense, accidental reasons. And then, depending upon their ability to produce offspring, they're either supported or decimated by the environment. Right? Now, finding change in the layers, the strata of uh, paleontology doesn't tell you what the engine is that produced the change. So you ask me what to do with that evidence? I don't know. <laughs> it's an open field. Do with it as you please. All that evidence shows directly is that there was change. And it shows a certain direction of change, even though the direction changes. Not always do things get more complicated, sometimes they get less complicated, and that's a, in itself a difficult story. But all the evidence shows directly is change. The question then is, does random variation plus selection adequately explain the change? And that's where the critique comes in. Because when you offer random, I just got, I got a book, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. The, uh, the, people talk about the survival of the fittest. So the play on words that's now popular is the arrival of the fittest. Where did the, these new forms come from? To be then selected by the environment and become more successful and so forth and so on. How did they originate? What kind of theory do you have that explains how they originate? And insofar as it's supposed to be a, an accidental process, not driven by any internal constraints, not driven by any ultimate purposes, which is under attack. But of course, as far as that's the theory, then what you need is a probability. And if you don't have a probability, you're not going to have adequate reason to believe that that's the appropriate um, explanation as to how the change took place. And that's why some people who, true believers like Jerry Coyne will tell you, are on the fringes, but some people are talking about internally driven changes, not externally produced by accidental processes, but driven by internal needs, and driven by the fact that the genome is ready for changes in the environment, and then changes to respond to the environment. That changes randomly and then just selected by the best ones that, that fit the environment. This is because they feel that the explanation in terms of random changes or uh, accidental changes is just not adequate. At any rate, that's the, the claim. When, when evolution means Accidental variation plus selection, and it's claimed that that explains the subtotal of the envelope of life. That's something which you need a probability for, and we haven't got a clue as to what the probability is. We haven't got any evidence of what the probability is. Okay? Now, um, one way that you can evaluate a field is to the reliability of its results, how the results stand up, and what kinds of critique the results receive. I don't know if you've heard about the case from Northern England about the moths 
the moths that demonstrate evolution before your very eyes. You can see in the history of the moths in northern England, evolution happening before your very eyes. This is a very interesting case study. But these are notes that are on my website. Um, Richard Dawkins, of whom I guess you probably heard. By the way, what was his position at Oxford? Does anybody know? He had a chair in the public understanding of science. He was not a scientist. He was a communicator of science to the lay public. That's what his chair was in. That may make us a little more gentle in criticizing his many errors and many failures because he was not a research scientist. He didn't create anything new. He didn't discover anything new. He popularized certain theories. At any rate, Dawkins says, natural selection can bring about minor changes like the dark coloration that has evolved in various species of moth since the Industrial Revolution. Okay. You read those words and you think, all right, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, dark coloration has evolved in these moths. What really happened? Well, what really happened, I'm going to read it to you from a guy named Ridley, who was a true believer in evolution, but he's much better than Dawkins. What really happened is you have a species of moth, and it always had two types, a darker type and a lighter type. And throughout the period of observation, there were always dark and light ones. Dark and light in the beginning, dark and light at the middle, and dark and light at the end. They just changed their frequency. Golly, if you read Dawkins, bring about minor changes like the dark coloration, doesn't it sound like evolution produced the dark coloration? Isn't that what, what Dawkins' words suggest to you? That's not what happened. Simply false. Here's what Ridley, Mark Ridley writes. The peppered moth has two types, a dark type and a lighter type. Before the Industrial Revolution, the lighter type was much the commoner of the two. There were more light ones. Then industrial areas, the dark type increased to become more abundant. In non-industrial areas, the lighter type remained more, um, more common. As industrial activity decreased, the lighter type became common again. Now, the explanation that's offered here is this. Industrial pollution caused lichens to grow on the trees. Lichens growing on the trees colored the, changed the color of the trees. It changed the color of the trees. The lighter moths became more visible to birds that eat the moths, and therefore they declined in their frequency. When the industrial pollution reduced and the lichens retreated, the trees went back to their original color, and the lighter ones uh, researched in their, in, their, uh, in their numbers in the population. That's the explanation. As I said, you have light and dark at the beginning, middle, and end. Now, what was the name of Darwin's book? Origin of Species. Origin of Species. That indicates that Darwin was preoccupied by origin. Origin means coming into existence, something new. If the theory of evolution is supposed to explain where new things come from, and you are studying a species of moth, and you have light and dark, light and dark, light and dark from beginning to end, there's no illustration of origin there at all. Nothing originated there. This is my critique. I mean, just eggs and, uh, you know, <laughs> apples and oranges, or eggs and gravel. It just had nothing to do with one thing. Second of all, did anybody deny? Was anybody contesting whether changing the backgrounds of camouflage would have an effect on the percentages that remain over decades? Nobody contested that. Nobody was fighting with that. So who is this addressed to? What critic is going to be bowled over by this? No one ever expressed an opinion against this. Okay, but that's just pure logic. That's really relatively trivial and unimportant. The experiment is much worse than that. Here's Jerry Coyne. Poor Jerry Coyne. He wrote one honest thing over here. It's a review in Nature. Uh, if you haven't heard of Nature, there are two great science journals in the world. One is Nature, which is a British journal. And one's called Science, which is an American journal. Of course, science is a little better, but okay. Leave it aside. Now, he wrote this review of the book in which, of a book in which this material was, was, um, was uh, discussed. 
This is what Jerry Coyne writes. Jerry Coyne, a true believer in evolution. He paid for this. He had to write a book, Why Evolution is True. And he has a, has a blog, Why Evolution is True, and everything else. But here, I guess he was sleeping when he wrote it. He wrote something honest. Listen to what he writes. This is Coyne now. From time to time, evolutionists re-examine a classical experimental study to find to their horror that is, it is flawed or downright wrong. He gives a list of four, one of which I'll explain to you if we have time. Until now, however, the prize horse and I stable of examples has been the evolution of um, the dark form in the peppered moth. Okay? This classic example is in bad shape. First of all, probably this moth does not rest on tree trunks. Bang! It doesn't rest on tree trunks. The whole point was the tree trunks change their color, and the birds who eat the moths off the tree trunks see these better than those because the, the, the color of the trees, because of the lichens, con conceals these. But they don't rest on tree trunks. So, um, what happens to this? What happens to this? this um, exactly two moths have been seen in such a position in more than 40 years of intensive search. So now, how did they do the experiments? You know how they did the experiments? The experimenter put the moths on the trees by hand. He put them on by hand and watched the birds eat them. That's what you call study of nature in the wild. You put them on by hand and see whether the birds eat them or not. But of course, left to their own devices, they never land on trees. The experimenter did the experiments in the daytime, of course, so the birds can see them. Typically, these moths don't light anywhere in the daytime. They fly all the way during the daytime because they light at night when, of course, the poor birds can't see them. Furthermore, this change in the percentage of the lighter colored moths didn't coincide with the change in the color of the trees. Didn't coincide. Didn't happen at the same time. Not only that, but there was a parallel change in the colors in North America, where there was no industrial uh, pollution and there were no lichens and no change in the color of the trees at all. Suggests that something much broader was going on and had nothing to do with it. Furthermore, people tried to replicate the study in later, in later experiments and it, was, and it, and it failed. Right? Moths had no tendency to choose backgrounds that, uh, whose color matches the, their own color. So that means they're not taking advantage of the, of the camouflage. Now, Coyne ends his review with these words. The author of the book that he's reviewing finds many other flaws in the work, many other flaws in addition to these flaws. But they are too numerous to list here. <laughs> I suggest to you, boys and girls, that, that this is beyond belief. This is really beyond belief. This is serious science. This is serious science? The prize horse in the stable, the best of all. This is serious science. So in desperate attempts to save themselves, they now say on the websites that, oh, well, people have done it again and they did a better job and so forth and so forth. Well, first of all, if this was in all the textbooks and still in some textbooks and was uncontested until 1997, shall I trust the newer studies? Were they done better? Why should I think that? This is a whole cult of people who are willing to pay anything to get support, even work that doesn't even deserve to be called shoddy. There's another one that he talks about, and that is um, Batesian mimicry, the Viceroy monarch butterflies. This works like this. Let's suppose you have a, a, a life form, whatever it is, I say an animal, that has a natural defense against predators, like the skunk or the red fox, you know what their defense is. A predator that attacks a skunk will do it only once in its lifetime. And will never do it again. Because if it gets a spray of that smell, it will remember very well not to attack skunks again. Now, how does it identify skunks? Well, it won't attack anything that looks like a skunk. Because it's afraid of getting hit again. All right. Suppose another animal evolves to look like a skunk. The chemical... Uh, uh, p potentiality to produce that smell is an extremely complex evolution. And it's much longer than just evolving the color of your coat. That's much easier, much faster. So it would pay for another species to evolve to look like skunks so that when, let's say, a wolf has an experience with a skunk, it won't eat those other ones either. 
I, the other ones don't have the smell, but the wolf's not going to take a chance because it looks like a skunk. That's called Batesian mimicry, Batesian for a guy named Bates who thought it up. Okay? Now, there are two species of butterfly, the monarchs and the viceroys. The monarchs taste terrible. Birds have been seen to eat a monarch butterfly, and they retch. They just retch. And, of course, birds aren't stupid. They turn out to be very smart. Um, some crows are smarter than, than, than chimpanzees. Um, and uh, if they have that one experience, they'll never touch another, monarch, uh, another uh, ambassador butterfly. Monarchs, uh, um, uh, another viceroy. Now, they'll never touch another monarch. Viceroys look very much like the monarchs. So, the thought was that the viceroys evolved to look like the monarchs and cash in on the fact that the monarchs taste terrible. That was the thought. And that example found its way in the textbooks for years and years. Now, you're not scientists. You're not trained to think critically and examine. But ask yourself, suppose you wanted to check this. Not just believe it because somebody like Bates thought it up. Not just believe it because it supports evolution. Suppose you wanted to check whether the viceroys are cashing in on the defense of the monarchs of tasting terrible. Is there anything you could possibly do to check whether they're cashing in on the other's defense or maybe they have their own defense? Here's the thought. Strip the wings from a viceroy and feed it to a bird and see what happens. Okay? Now, you aren't PhD professor, evolutionist, but that's a pretty simple test, right? It took decades for somebody to perform the test. Guess what? The birds retch on the viceroys also. Mm -hmm. The birds retch on the viceroys also, which means the viceroys are not cashing in on the uh, defense of the monarchs. They have their own defense. But it took decades to think it up. Why? Because it fits. It fits, so it's got to be used. It's direct evidence. We can put it in the textbooks. So, coin admits they don't use that one anymore because it was exploded. But this one, the, the moth is supposed to be the best of all, and that's exploded. How many exploded cases does it take to get, make you suspicious these people aren't self-critical? They aren't serious in that respect. Here's another one. This is one that goes up and down every 10 years. Um, you heard about the extinction of the dinosaurs? There are people who think that it's not true. It's not true. In fact, we are surrounded by dinosaurs. They are the birds. Some of the dinosaurs evolved to become birds. And this goes up and down. There's, a, there's an institute for evolution at the University of Iowa, and they do very specialized work all over the world. And every 10 or 15 years, it goes up and down. There's a book reviewed by a fellow named Larry Martin. Larry Martin is one of the foremost experts on the birds of the Mesozoic era. He's one of the paleontological eras. And he writes, I began to grow disenchanted with the bird dinosaur link when I compared the 85 or so anatomical features seriously proposed as being shared by birds and dinosaurs. Let's figure this out. You've got a dinosaur, you have a bird. Birds have bones, they have uh, certain things, in the, you know, ex uh, external shapes, skull and so forth and so on, and dinosaurs. 85 common elements. That's a lot. That's a lot. 85 common elements. You know, that would be very convincing even to me, and I'm a big skeptic about everything. You know, 85. So he decided to check, examine them. Listen to what he writes. To my shock, virtually none of the comparisons held up. Virtually none. Virtually none out of 85. Now listen, boys and girls, I don't pledge allegiance to Larry Martin, but if he's one of the world's greatest experts on this subject, and these guys say they've got 85s that are, that are common, and he says virtually none are common, is that a fixed science? Is that a methodology that's working well where the top experts can disagree 85 to 0? The moral of the story is such poor attention to detail has been repeated with almost every feature to cite the supported, uh, to support a bird dinosaur relation. Virtually every one is a result of poor attention to detail. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you don't have that in physics. Kim'at. You have it in astronomy and in cosmology, but you don't have it typically in physics. You don't have it typically in, in chemistry. 
it's hard to take this kind of thing seriously. Now, here's another example. How is it supposed to work? I've had the first thing that makes copies of itself. It's churning out. It's 1, 2, 4, 8, 60, 32. Churning away at copies. And it's very good at making copies, but not perfect. Not perfect. From time to time, it makes a mistake in the copy. Now, a thing that makes copies of itself is very complicated. You know, your PC can't make copies of itself, and it's pretty complicated. And if you randomly change something, chances are it's just going to go to pieces. It's, not, it's just not going to work. Imagine adding a line from your telephone book into the computer code in your computer. Is that going to improve its performance? Probably not. But if you have enough of them changing randomly, in enough random changes, the vast majority of them will just kill the thing, you'll have an improvement. So let's call the original ones A's. 1A, one 2A's, 4A's, 6, 32, 128 A's. And then after a billion, a trillion, and that includes a million glitches, an accidental glitch that makes them better. Call them A star. Now you got A's on the field and A stars. A stars are better at making copies. They make it a little faster. Their copies last a little longer. They're a little more durable. They can make copies at a wider range of, of temperatures. They're better at making copies. Now, there's a finite amount of resources to make copies out of. Sooner or later, the A stars are going to outcompete the A's. And the A stars are going to dominate the field until, until when the A stars are copying themselves, glitches are made, until a new glitch, after a million glitches that kill the thing, there'll be a glitch that makes an even better A star, call it A double star, and then you have three things in the field. Well, A star is better than A. A double star is better than A star. Sooner or later, the A's are going to go out. They're going to lose in the competition. And then the A stars and the A double stars are going to be slugging it out until the A triple stars come along. That's how it works. That's the whole process in a, uh, you know, in a nutshell. <clears throat> okay, that means the process by itself drives extinction. It has been estimated that 99% of all species of life are extinct. And evolution expects that. Because there's this constant competition, reading Malthus <laughs> wrongly, and the, the, the exponential per, the, uh, growth of, of population against a finite amount of resources. Eventually, they're going to starve to death. Okay, leave that aside, but that's the, that's the idea. Okay, there's a fellow named David Raup who wrote a book called Extinction. Cheerful title. The University of Chicago, world's expert on extinction. He writes, The disturbing reality is that for none of the thousands of well-documented extinctions in the geological past do we have a solid explanation of why the extinction occurred. Not one. We have many proposals and specific cases, but equally plausible scenarios can be invented with ease. The only evidence we have for the inferiority of the victims of extinction is the fact of their extinction, a circular argument. In other words, suppose you want to test this idea. Darwin's idea predicts that there'll be competition, and competition will drive species to extinction. But well, you want to test that. Well, look at the extinctions that you can document, of which there are thousands, and see if you can find evidence that the extinction occurred because of competition. That's right. That's the way to do it, right? Well, in none of the thousands of cases that are available have you any documentation that it's the inferior ones that, got, that became extinct. Now, Rob doesn't write this, but Stephen Jay Gould writes it elsewhere. There's a piece of logic behind this that's very important. You see two uh, <coughs> species in competition with one another, and then you see that one drops out. So you look at the differences, and you say, well, this one has sharper claws, or this one has longer legs. That's clearly an advantage. So that must be why this one won and this one lost. Yeah, but suppose it had come out the other way. Suppose it come out the other way that the, that the one with shorter legs and blunter claws won. So then you get the opposite explanation. Listen, to grow longer legs takes longer time in gestation. To have sharper claws requires using up resources that have been borrowed from someplace else. So since it took longer time in gestation, the females were longer time pregnant, a pregnant animal is much easier prey for a predator, and they ate up the pregnant animals. That's why the species went extinct. Every difference between A and B is going to give a superiority to A and an inferiority to A. No difference is clearly and simply 
superior or inferior. And that being the case, if A succeeds, you stress the superiority. If A fails, you stress the inferiority. There's no way to predict because you have to make a bottom line assessment as to which form is superior. And that's extremely difficult to do. Is man's intelligence a clear factor in leading for, to his survival and uh, superiority, superior, uh, su success in, in the planet? Well, so far we're succeeding and dominating the planet, so it's easy to say yes. But suppose atomic warfare had led to our utter demise and the planet would be taken over by cockroaches. Uh, radiation will not affect the cockroaches at all. They'll be very happy. Right? Then what we say? Well, obviously, human intelligence led to their extinction. So it's a terrible demerit. By the way, Ernst Meyer, whom I quoted before, points out that the high intelligence of human beings is the only example of high intelligence in the entire animal world, whereas the eye evolved independently 40 times. He said, that's because the eye is clearly very, very useful. And it's not obvious that intelligence is very, very useful. Otherwise, it should have evolved more often. Human infants spend more time becoming viable than any other animal species. If the human uh, species had died out 5,000 years ago, the explanation would have been clear. If you are a saber-toothed tiger, you like little children because they're toddling around, because they can't defend themselves. So you're going after them. The, the, the saber-toothed tiger is chasing a gazelle, has to outrun a gazelle. It's nothing to outrun a six-year-old boy or girl. So that's why they went extinct. They went extinct because they had no chance to get the predators. Is human intelligence obvious an advantage when you take into account the whole totality of human life? No, not obviously. If we had been competed out of existence, we'd easily been able to explain it. That means we have no way to pin down on any of the extinctions that it's due to competition and that being the case, a major field of evidence is simply closed to us. Well, that ought to count. The theory makes a strong prediction, and we have no evidence that that prediction is true. That's not evidence that it's false, but it's a gigantic hole in the evidence. Uh, let me briefly comment on uh, the origin of life. This is, this is a real, you can look this up on the, on the internet. There are endless articles on this. Origin of life. If you ask, where did the self-replicator come from? If you ask an evolutionist, he has a dodge. That's not my job. That's not my job. My job, evolution is the trace of replication. How things develop when they make copies of themselves. So of course, evolution only starts when you have something that's making a copy of itself. Where that first thing came that made copies of itself is not the theories of evolution's job to explain that. Okay, that's all right. Specialization is very important in science and certainly justifiable. But if you are trying to, to defend a totally naturalistic scientific worldview, you can't just blink that problem away. That problem has to be solved. If you can't show any plausible origin for the first self-replicator, if you have reason to think that a self-replicator by the processes that we recognize is not possible or extremely, extremely improbable, then you have a problem in your picture. I remember an article in the Scientific American, now this goes way back, 1991, called In the Beginning. They traced the eight current theories of origin of life. Eight widely vari uh, varying theories of origin of life. Tell me something, if you have a scientific problem about which there are eight theories, is that good or bad? bad. It's terrible. Because it means seven-eighths of the researchers in the field are against each theory. So that means that, you know, each theory is really <laughs> overwhelmed by a majority of critics. Now, um, they um, interviewed a fellow, a fellow named Miller, who was party to the miller urea experiments in the 50s, which were supposed to have shown life being evolved in a test tube, which turned out to be false also. Um, and they asked him, Professor Miller, nothing's working. Would you consider the possibility of God? And he said, no, absolutely not. We're doing something wrong, that he did admit. We're doing something wrong, but we'll fix it. We'll fix it and we'll explain it. Okay, that was 1991. It's now 2015. They haven't fixed it. Origin of life is just as bad as it was before. If you want to see a nice review of the contemporary evidence, there's a, uh, a website called Torah Explorer. Um, and he has, I think put it out last year, a review of all the contemporary uh, uh, site. But you're going to have to go look at a, at a Torah source, God forbid. 
you know, that's going to be clearly prejudiced and, and, and not neutral, look up origin of life and look up, uh, and look up what you find. And you'll find that there is no remotely plausible um, theory that, that uh, compels even a consensus of, uh, of thought on the subject. So that's still a glaring hole in the worldview, the worldview of the, of the naturalist scientific uh, position. And I'll give you one more. Darwin wrote that evolution has to take place gradually. The reason he wrote that is the reason that I, t I mentioned briefly before. You have something that's busy making copies of itself. If you, if you make a serious change in it, it's almost for sure going to be wrecked. Uh, let's take the giraffes. By the way, the whole story of the giraffes competing for the high leaves on the branches and everything else is wrong for a million reasons. One German naturalist went into the bush with the, with the giraffes and found that the whole, the whole story about the giraffes is, is simply not true. But consider this. Uh, suppose that the longer neck gave them an advantage in eating the higher, tree, higher leaves. By the way, the, the females are considerably shorter than the males, so maybe that should have driven the females extinct? No, 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 of course not. No, of course not. You get that. Now, um, you've got a much longer neck. Well, the blood has to get to the brain, doesn't it? Is the heart strong enough to pump the blood up to the brain? Maybe you get a, got to a, evolve a stronger heart at the same time? Hmm. What about the balance organs that are in the, in the, in the head? If the head isn't related to the, the body in the way it was, then... Maybe the balance organs just won't work and they'll just tip over and get eaten by the local lion, you know? You've got to readjust, retune the balance organs for the differing position that it has vis-a-vis -vis the bulk of the body of the animal. Um, the blood vessels. Blood vessels have to be strong enough to hold the blood. Indeed, the, uh, the, uh, the giraffe has a kind of shut-off valve so that when the, the uh, pump, then the heart pumps it up on the upstroke, it doesn't just wash back down on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, when the blood is absorbing blood because of the gigantic height. So there's a kind of shut-off valve that holds it there till the next up pump, right? That's something that's unique in, in giraffes. Without that, the whole system isn't going to work. So you have a number of different interlocking um, um, uh, mutations, new, new features that have to occur at the same time. Well, you're certainly not going to have, that means you can't have a sudden three-foot extension of the neck and get the advantage because the animal will die. What's the probability of getting the three-foot extension of the neck and the stronger heart and the, and the balance organs retuned? Re, re and the, obviously not. So what do you have? You have little changes. A one-inch thing of the neck and then a little stronger heart and then a little bit of change of this. But then you've got four or five systems evolving by random changes together. That means if each one's involved is, is changing randomly, then each some, when this goes up, this one's going to go down, or it's going to stay the same. And then because this one went up by itself, if the neck goes up a little bit and the heart doesn't go up, then the, blood, the brain's going to get less blood. It's going to get less blood. It can't run away from the tigers. It can't run away from the tigers. It's going to be meat. It's going to be supper. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not an obvious, uh, it's, not, it's not an obvious story. At any rate, you don't, that's why you need little changes. Because without little changes, it's hopeless. But the fossil record didn't yield little changes. The fossil record doesn't show yet little changes. Indeed, as Stephen Stanley was at Johns Hopkins University, and a true believer in evolution, myriads of species have inhabited the Earth for millions of years without evolving noticeably. You follow a particular species for millions of years and you don't see any change. Major evolutionary transitions have been wrought during episodes of rapid change, which we don't observe. We don't see them. Evolution has moved by fits and starts. In other words, you see this, go up a three, through a few million years, looks the same, and then all of a sudden you see something else which is considerably different. You don't see the in-between. The fossil record offered convincing evidence for evolution, but not for gradual evolution. What? to do. How do you deal with that? Listen to how Darwin dealt with it. Unfortunately, says Stanley, circular reasoning soon crept into the evaluation of the record. Darwin had made elaborate claims that the data were too sparse to ever support his gradualistic scheme. 
He said, you know why you don't find the smooth transitions? Because too much is left out. The, the, the uh, paleontology, the fossil strata, leave out a lot of the transitions. They're just missing from the strata. It's inherently incomplete. Lots of things don't get fossilized. Things don't get preserved. But, as Stanley points out, if you ask Darwin, how do you know the fossil record is sparse? How do you know it leaves out all these transitions? The only reason he gives is, well, if it didn't leave them out and they aren't there, then my theory's wrong. So they've got to be there. They must have been there. The forms must have existed, because otherwise my theory's wrong. In other words, he relied upon his theory to condemn the fossil record, which, as Stanley points out, was an abandonment of empiricism. What he should have said is, the fossil record doesn't support my theory, period. He did say that. I mean, Darwin was pretty honest. But here, he, I think I would have to call it an honest mistake. He said, if you trust today's fossils, fossil record, you should reject my theory. Now, so he said, but don't trust it because it's missing. Why is it missing? Because <laughs> otherwise, that theory would be false. The natural thing to do if you're logical is to say, well, then your theory is false. Now, this was 1859. You could get away with the thought that maybe it's missing in 1859. You couldn't get it away, get away with it in 1959. After 100 years of searching, and by the way, major, major transitions are utterly without transitional forms, flowering plants and insects. And other things. The whole of the insect world comes into existence with no predecessors. And they talk about the, the whale, you know, coming from something that looked like a fox. So, first of all, you know, <laughs> how many intermediaries would you like between something looking like a fox and a whale? Two intermediaries. 16? 104? You know? They may have found five that they claim. Then they found bones in the whale which they claim are hip bones. Well, I remember the, bo the, bo the dinosaur bones in the birds, you know, and I'm a little suspicious if they tell me that they're really hip bones. I want to know. I want a lot more evidence that they're say-so because they happen to look like it. When 85 examples turned out to be turned out to be zero, according to another expert. So they tell me that you found hip bones. Excuse me, I'm a little skeptical. Your record is not very good on these types of observations. But at any rate, what happened in 1959? So uh, Stephen Jay Gould and um, Miles Eldridge, who was the curator of the Museum of Natural History in New York, got together and wrote a very famous paper, famous, debated, discussed, vilified, supported by others, called "Punctuated Equilibria." They said the record shows the same for millions of years, and then all of a sudden, a considerably different. And then all of a sudden, considerably after. That's what it shows. Here's how we would explain it. Now, I'm telling you the original explanation. It went through many <laughs> evolutions, and it became more sophisticated with more uh, high-powered mathematics. But the, the first thought was this. When you have a large interacting population, changes get swamped. They get swamped by interacting with the rest of the population. You can't catch on. But if you have a small, isolated population, changes take place, they have a chance to catch on and spread through the small, isolated population. So, you have the plains of Africa. Millions and millions of wildebeest start charging around on the plains. Nothing's going to happen there. That's where you find millions of years without change. But there's a gigantic storm, and uh, about 500 wildebeest stampede over a narrow cleft in the mountains. And they find themselves, after the storm is over, in a, in a valley, and they don't know how to get back. So they're stuck. 500 of them. It's a small valley, so it can't support an increasing population. So there's 500 of them there for, you know, 100,000 years, turn it up, blink of an eye. 200,000 years. During that time, they can evolve. Sharper hooves and stronger teeth and stronger leg muscles and better coordination and better eyesight and all sorts of things. Then after 200,000 years, there's an earthquake and the pass of the mountains cracks and the way is open to the the mainland, you know, to the, to, the, to the plains, and out come the new 500 vastly improved wild beasts. And they simply conquer the plains, they outproduce the old ones, and they drive them to extinction. Now, when you are doing your paleontology, where are you going to dig? You're going to dig on the plains, obviously. You're going to find that little valley. So as you're going down, you're going to find the new improved wild beast for a few million years, and then you go down and find the old unimproved wild beast. That's all you're going to find. That's because you didn't find that little valley. That little valley in which the rapid changes took place. And besides, rapid changes don't always fossilize the same way. The probability of finding is next to nothing. 
That's the explanation of punctuated equilibria. You see equilibria that are punctuated by substantial change. That's because you didn't find the, the locus of the gradual change. Darwin is right. His theory is right. There's something very subtle going on here. And Gould, to his credit, in his monumental work, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, 1,400 pages, which I read. Ask your biology professors if they read it. I read it. Gould is honest about this. You are creating an explanation which tells you if this is the way it happened, you're not going to find evidence that it happened. Isn't that a little suspicious? Isn't science supposed to be driven by evidence? Here's an explanation that says if our explanation is right, you're not going to find the evidence that it's right. So then, um, why should I believe it? <laughs> I mean, it may be right. Indeed, and at least one way to look at it is what you've done is shift the burden of proof. You want to use the fact that there are big changes as a proof that evolution is wrong? No. We can, we can explain it. We can uh, defend ourselves against a proof that it's wrong. You haven't shown it's wrong. It could be there are those isolated valleys where evolution took place, according to Hoyle or according to, Dor to Darwin. <clears throat> But that's hardly evidence that it's true. It's hardly evidence that the punctuated equilibrium theory is correct. So Gould, to his credit, cooks up some very sophisticated statistical techniques to try to show indirectly that there's evidence that the changes took place through this kind of, of uh, this kind of process. But the bottom line is that the fossil record has gigantic gaps which have never been plugged. Now, um, the size of the, gulls, uh, the, the bills of beaks change, and uh, the colors of the, the feathers change, and um, the, the, the diets change. Does that mean that a, that, um, a pigeon could become a, uh, an eagle? Does it mean that uh, uh, a mouse could become a fox? Does, how far does that go? What's called, this is called microevolution. Microevolution means tiny changes in the properties of a species versus going from species to species in order to order bigger and bigger changes. The assumption that you hear from all the true believers is, well, you just accumulate a lot of little changes. Right? Not everybody believes that. Even Stephen Jay Gould, one of the deans of evolution, said explicitly that changes on the small scale are not the same as changes on the large scale. This is like quoting from a, an article which came out before his book, but in his book he talks about it at great length. Variation within a species doesn't tell you how to treat interactions between species. The phenomena are disparate and exist at different scales. Causal continuity does not unite all levels. The small does not always aggregate smoothly into the large. So when... Uh, Dawkins writes that he can easily imagine how a mouse could evolve into a giraffe if it had, you know, uh, several million years and 2,000 generations. That may be an expression of his imagination, and that's a testimony to his imagination, but it doesn't follow that it's really possible. It doesn't follow that it's really possible. Here's my burlesque on the idea. I have a theory as to how the, the pyramids got built. Are you aware that ants work collectively, thousands of them, to create vast underground tunnels, and they can fight together as, as, a, as a body against other ant species, and they can have to form a trek, and they can eat everything in their, in, their, in their path? Thousands and thousands of ants working together. Okay. So I say that the pyramids were built by a trillion ants. Do you know each ant can lift eight times its own weight? Did you know that? So that's a trillion ants. A trillion ants can lift millions of pounds. Are you convinced? Are you interested? I think what you're to say is, so far as we have observed, the upper limit on how many ants can work together is 10,000, 20,000. You're talking about a trillion? We have no reason to think that a trillion ants can act together. No reason to accept that. You can't just go from 10,000 to a trillion. Things just, well, just up there, some more zeros, you know. Just put them in the same environment. Let them all work together. Maybe they can't do that. I need positive evidence that you can aggregate it that way. 
Gould says the mechanism that produces minor changes within species can't be just accumulated and say, well, if you have thousands and thousands of minor changes, it'll add up to major changes. Gould says, no, it doesn't work that way. It needs a different mechanism. If anybody tells you, oh, we know how it happens, the little changes just accumulated the big changes, you say, okay, okay, that's what your professor told you, but did he read Gould? Did he ever hear of Gould at Harvard? No? Hmm, I wonder what kind of thorough job he's doing if he hasn't heard of Gould, right? So there's a lot there that's controversial, a lot there that's weak, and as I said at the beginning, there's certainly no reason to believe it's true. And that's enough for my purposes, okay? Okay, I'm listening here, and uh, this is all my website. So.